Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Thamri. Welcome everybody to the beginner's guide to Final Fantasy XIV. I'm gonna try to make this as simple and as concise as possible and try to take it all in one singular take. If there are any mess ups that I do or if any corrections needs to be done or did I miss out a particular detail, please go ahead and leave it in the comments below for other beginners to check out. If there is something I missed out, make sure to check the comments below for any other extra tips and extra hints that maybe I missed out or maybe I forgot to focus on. Let's go ahead and begin. The game is available to be moved and controlled through keyboard and mouse and a controller on both PC and PS4. They are interchangeable, so if you do take a mouse and keyboard and plug it into the PS4, or if you just find a control like an Xbox One, Xbox 360, or a PS4 controller and just plug it into your PC with a USB or wireless adapter, you'll be able to move around in the game. As you can see right now, I am playing with keyboard and mouse. I'm able to function and run around with keyboard and mouse and strafe in the keyboard and mouse layout that is default for the game. I can also, however, switch to, to the controller layout and I have my controller right there next to me and I'm able to run around and function the game as with a controller. It is very easy to use a controller for this game and keyboard and mouse as well. They can actually be pretty interchangeable and I've seen many players do some incredible things with both keyboard and mouse. So far, I'm primarily focusing on keyboard and mouse because it's something that I'm used to for my MMOs. With that said, if you feel more comfortable with controller, feel free to play with controller as this game has one of the best controller support I've ever felt in any MMO, let alone, you know, a game of this kind of caliber. Regarding quests, you'll be introduced with a bunch of quests for the game. You'll have main quests, side quests plus as I like to call them, and side quests. Main quests have a very fancy flame icon around them and are going to be the primary anchor that you'll follow out throughout the entire Final Fantasy XIV game. Final Fantasy XIV is very story heavy and very story driven. This main quest line will be the most important thing you'll have to follow along with in order to expand the content and go from A Realm of Born into Heaven's Ward and from Heaven's Ward into Stormblood. Completing the main story is mandatory. If you, however, get frustrated with it, or if you really, really, really want to skip it and got plenty of cash to spend, you can, however, get a story skip potion. However, it is not required to have a story skip potion, as the story is pretty, in my opinion, is a pretty solid story for an MMO. It's not that hard to get through. It will, however, take time and investment, sure. But there are always groups queuing in for trials and dungeons that will be required for you to do for the story. So finding groups to play with is not going to be that difficult whatsoever. And if you have an issue, feel free to ask friends or free company members if, you, if they can help you out. Free company members being guilds in this particular game. Side quest plus, I like to call them, will be optional things you can do in order to unlock major pieces of content such as new classes, new jobs, new professions, new gathering professions, even all crafting. You'll be able to also unlock dungeons, uh, hard mode versions of dungeons, extreme versions of raids, and so on and so forth. It expands on the type of content and the amount of playability you have within the game. It also unlocks different features like the ability to change hairstyles or the glamour system or the dice system. They're going to be pretty important to unlock, so just go ahead and do the side quests whenever you see them. They're going to be very easy to spot. They have a blue background on them and a plus next to them. Side quests, the regular side quests, can be differentiated between side quests plus because they have a bronze background and no plus. From side quests plus, usually you will get items or gil and experience by completing them, as well as a side story. They're not required, but they still are really good if you're going to be leveling, and if you're going to be doing already main quest, why not pick up some side quests to complete on the way, just to keep things a little bit more interesting and to gain more experience for the time invested. Now, regarding Athrites, Athrites are the next big thing and will help you get around yours a much faster and much quicker. What is behind me is considered an Athrite, a big crystal. You'll be using this crystal for the most part as your home port, as a return point, and in order to travel and teleport throughout Eorzea. Atherites can be used in order to traverse large distances in Eorzea and are highly required if you're going to be traveling back and forth. The story does require you to backtrack a little bit every now and then, so it's highly recommended to attune yourself to an Atherite. The way you attune to the Atherite is by walking up to it, targeting it, and activating it. 
already activated this particular Aetherite, but if you haven't, your character will do a little casting animation and you get a confirmation that you have this Aetherite added to your travel log or to your, to your Aetherite log. Likewise, also in Final Fantasy XIV, you also encounter this small Aetherites that will let you teleport all over home cities. Each capital city has those in place. If I access the Ethernet in Grudania, I'll have multiple locations available for me, and I'll be able to teleport to these locations instead of running them directly myself in order to cut down the distance of running around. Let's say for example I really want to get to the Miketo's Amphitheater. Instead of running there, I could just go use the teleport for the Aetherite and take my teleport over there. They are really useful for fast travel and can help you get around city-states and large locations all around Eorzea. Eorzea has a lot of Aetherites to unlock. For example, the location, the area that I'm in right now, the Black Shroud, has all these Aetherites located in all these sub-areas, in North Shroud, Gridania, East Shroud, Central, Lavender Beds doesn't have any bodies connected directly to Gridania, and South Shroud has two of them. The Aetherites, large Aetherites, can be designated by these large clusters that you see right here on the map. If you mouse over them, it will give you the ability to see the name, and will give you also the cost to teleport to them. It does cost to teleport to Aetherites, and depending on the distance, let's say for example, I want to go from Gridania, I want to head over to the far eastern continents, head over to Hingashi, and get to Kogane. To teleport to Kogane will cost me 699 gil. While that may sound really expensive at low level, as you move up throughout the game, earning gil will not be an issue for the most part. Doing things like daily dungeons and daily roulettes, which we'll talk about later in the future, is the simplest thing you can ever do. Currently right now I'm setting at a nice 3.3 million, and I'm not really gathering or crafting, I'm just selling a bunch of junk that I don't really need. And I'm also saving it, not spending it too much unless it's really for repairs. Anyway, Aetherites can also be used as a return point that I talked about. Let me go ahead and get back to the Aetherite while I talk about it. If you ever played a game like World of Warcraft and you had a Hearthstone, you could attune the Hearthstone to an inn, correct? This actually functions very similarly. You get to pick a large Aetherite as a return point, so when you die in battle or if you need to return and you don't want to pay extra money, you can set this one as a register free destination to be considered as your primary return point. My current return point is set right now over in Garabania. I'm currently set mine for Raga's Reach, so if I do return, I'll be teleported to Raga's Reach free of charge. You can only set, I believe, one Aetherite as a return point, well, yeah, return point, and that will be for free. It's good, if you're going to be traveling all over the place, to set your return point to the closest Aetherite in your vicinity. So let's say, for example, you're running around and leveling in South Shroud and you're leveling in the area of the swamps and lower paths. If you're going to be staying here for a while, it might be a good idea to, re to set to Camp Tranquil uh, Aetherite as your return point. Now, moving on to traveling around Eorzea. There are other means of traveling aside from Aetherites. One of the ways to travel is by mounts. Right here, I have several mounts available for me. These mounts you unlock at around level 20 when you complete a main story quest and join a grand company, which we will cover in the future. Don't worry, we'll get there in a little bit. The mounts can be accessed uh, just through this window, and you can set it on the hotbar to be accessed in the world. Currently right now, I'm set in the city-state, so I cannot mount right now, but it is good to always have a mount ready and on a hotbar somewhere for you to easily access it. If you do not have a mount, however, you can use this Chocobo Porters, or Chocobo Keeps. The Porter system is like a taxi system or a flight path system in World of Warcraft if you ever played that. It can be used to rent out a Chocobo Porter. It may co it will cost a little bit of money, a little bit of gil per uh, per the amount of uh, minutes, you know, the ride and the length, I guess. I can get to Camp Tranquil within 3 minutes, it will cost me 50 gil, Quarry Mill, 50 gil, Fogger Float, 30 gil, but it will take only 1 minute. It's not really that big of a deal to use the Chocobo Porter, and if you need to go far distances within your particular vicinity or area, it is highly recommended to go ahead and attune yourself to every Chocobo Keep. The way you attune to them is by walking up to them, they have an exclamation point uh, or exclamation mark over their uh, heads, right click on them, and you will attune to them. You can also rent a Chocobo if you really want to, 
Renting chocobos will cost you a certain amount of gil and will only last you for a so much time. Renting chocobos is like getting a chocobo that you technically can't own just for a short period of time. And if you really need to cross distances real quick and you do not have a mount, feel free to use rent a chocobo in order to cross some distances. Like I said, it does have timers on it, so it's, you know, gonna run out eventually, but it's a really inexpensive way to travel. Highly recommend using that at your earlier time. Now, talking a little bit about fees, uh, Chocobo Porter is gonna be the cheapest one to use, but it's pretty quick. Atherites are gonna be most expensive, but they are far and wide, it can be traveling over long distances, and traveling by yourself on foot is free if you ever wanna do that. If you're crossing like continents, it's highly recommend just use Atherite, and eventually when you get a lot of gil, using Atherite system in order to teleport all over the place will not even put a dent in your pocket, trust me. Now, talking a little bit about the next part of the game, the classes that a lot of people want to talk about. Let me go ahead and head over under the roof here so I can get out of this nasty weather. Classes are separated as follows. Tanks, healers, and DPS. For tanks, we have Paladin with an icon of a shield, Warrior with an icon of a two-sided axe blade, and Dark Knight with an icon of what seems to be a weapon, a Dark Knight weapon, the two-handed sword. For healers, we have the White Mage, with an icon of a staff. Scholar, with an icon of, I believe, some sort of a zodiac sign, not 100% sure what it is, or maybe it's supposed to be a book. Scholar, anyway, one of the healers. And Astrologian, with an icon of two cards, back to back. For melee, we have melee DPS, physical range DPS, and magical range DPS. Melee, we have the monk, which I believe this is supposed to be the fists. Dragoon, which has this uh, spear tip for the dragoon. Ninja, we have the Ninja Shuriken, I think, I believe that's what it is. And Samurai, we have the Samurai Hilt, or the Samurai Blade. Looking from top down. Bard, we have the Harp. Machinist, we have the Gun. Black Mage, we have the Fireball, I believe. I believe that's supposed to be a Fireball. Summoner has this crest-looking thing, which I believe might be also a part of a book, perhaps. Not really sure, these two particularly have like a really interesting symbols. Granted, both uh, jobs come from like old-school Charlayan history. They have a very high lore built around them if you ever do the job quest for them. Anyway, and Red Mage comes with the Saber, which looks kind of like the White Mage, kind of just spiky and upside down. Anyway, understanding what these icons are is going to be really important when you get into groups. Because over at the right side of each of the player's names, going to be a little icon and the color behind them. Blue stands for tanks, green stands for healer, red stands for DPS. Eventually you will learn these icons by hand and you won't have to examine players as they go on. But if you do need to examine a player that is standing around, you can always just select them and right click on them. Like we got over there, Mistress Streya. Let me see if I can target Mr. Streya over here. Mr. Streya, can, may, I, may I target you, perhaps, perchance? There we go. Right-clicking and examining, or you can do the alternate option also on the controller as well, where you click X and whatever, pull up the little side menu. And you can see it says White Mage. This icon is not colored, however, so remember about that. This one will not be colored, but it will say their job right there as the White Mage. Then she will be able to recognize the gear and jobs and classes by their weapons, as each job has different weapons. Paladin has sword and shield, warrior has a double axe, I can actually show them right there. Sword and shield for paladin, warrior has an axe, I got it right here, the Pajali axe, the glowing axe, dark knight has a two-handed blade, and so on and so forth. Each job has their own unique weapons, their own unique stances, for the most part their own unique animations, and their own unique ways of playing them. Eventually, over time, you'll be able to recognize all of it, so do not worry about it one bit. Now, to talk a little bit about melee DPS, the reason they're spread out this way. Melee DPS, for the most part, are going to be in the melee stance, so which is why they're grouped together. Physical range DPS shoot off physical projectiles. Magical range DPS shoot off magical projectiles. The reason I separated between physical and magical DPS is because some of them may or may not have the ability to increase damage for ma magical damage and physical damage. And it really depends on which job you play. Each one is going to play a little bit differently. Physical range are able to move around on the go and fire away without needing to stay still for the most part, aside from Bard's ability to use full Requiem. 
or the machinist's ability to use a flamethrower, which plants them on the ground still until they finish using their castbar or their animation in order to complete the action fully. Or machinist does have the ability to move to interrupt flamethrower, but it's highly on use for the most part, unless you really need to move. Now, Black Mage, Summoner, and Red Mage, the casting, a magical range DPS, all have cast bars. Anything that they're going to be using for the most part will have a cast bar, aside from Red Mage, who is able to get dual cast, which lets the next cast ability be insta cast. Each job will play differently, so it's highly required to, well, not really required, but it's highly beneficial to learn the playstyles and how each job here on this particular panel is going to operate. And that is only covering D.O.W., which is Disciple of War and Disciple of Magic. There's also D.O.T.L., Disciple of the Land and Disciple of the Hand. Disciple of the Hand are crafters. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 of them. Carpenter, Blacksmith, Armor, Goldsmith, Leatherworker, Weaver, Alchemist, and Culinarian. We got three Gatherers, Miner, Botanist, and Fisher. Actually, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so I'm kind of going a little crazy here. I apologize. These can be unlocked over in different locations and can actually be designated on the big map by the icons. For example, the Archer Guild will have the Archer symbol on it, and the Carpenter Guild has the Saw on it. By the way, these particular job quests, you will not see them at first as they are as a job quest. Bard you will see at first as Archer, if you don't have Bard unlocked. This is the Bard icon, which is the evolved version of Archer. Let's go ahead and get inside here. The way you require different jobs is by going over, for the most part, to the guild receptionist or the NPC that unlocks the job. You can find them either online or you can find them walking around the city for some of them like Samurai and Red Mage over in Uldah. But for the most part, for the starting jobs for crafting, gathering, and battle professions and jobs, you'll be able to go over here and talk to the guild receptionist. You'll get a quest to eventually go talk to the guild master. And eventually, you'll also be able to get a certain gear that is only available for your particular job or profession, whether it's be gathering or crafting. Talking about different gear sets, actually, it's going to talk about how to make different gear sets and how uh, some of the people have actually been asking how I was able to set up this particular style and what do these buttons over here mean. These buttons over here I set up so that I can go over here to the Paladin icon, click on the Paladin, and switch to my Paladin gear set. Since everything regarding Final Fantasy XIV is based around the weapon that you're wielding, just by switching out the weapon, is enough to switch out your job. Let's say, for example, I want to put on Dark Knight. All I would have to do is take the main hand for the Paladin and switch it out for the main hand of the Dark Knight. And then immediately switches my job entirely. And I can do the same thing to revert back if I want to. But in order to keep track of everything that's going on, for the most part, I use these little icons, these little gear sets, in order to keep up with everything that is going on for my jobs and all the jobs that I have unlocked. Let me go ahead and put this on again, there we go, to get the shield and the job crystal back. Soul crystals will be given to you at level 30 after you do a uh, side quest for, a for your class in order to unlock the job. Like Gladiator turns into Paladin, and whenever you have the soul of the Paladin equipped, you get access to Paladin-only abilities, which is going to be something really important for your you know, overall ability to tank and everything. Now, in order to create these gear sets, Let's say, for example, I have this carpenter, and I can remove the carpenter. Let's say, for example, I want to make a brand new gear set for my paladin. All I have to do is just make sure I have the set that I have equipped, and then create new gear set. Now created the new paladin set. You can change, you can display the set, preview the set, resign the gear, resign the set number if you want to, so it's not number 17, and even change the set name. Let's say, for example, I want to do set example. There we go, and there you go, there it is. Same function can also be accessed on the PS4 in order to type in the set example name or whatever else you want to do. In order to drag these particular sets onto my bar, however, let me delete the set, all I have to do is select this particular set, hold down left click, drag it out, and drop it off in whatever slot that I have available. For the most part, I use it on PC in order to micromanage it instead of going over to the gear set list through here every single time, selecting a set and equipping it, or vice versa. It just makes it a lot easier for me to go ahead and change jobs on a whim, which is really nice and handy when it comes to managing all these jobs that I have. 
nevertheless, let's go ahead and keep on moving here. Hotbar. You realize that this hotbar over here changes whenever I switch jobs, but this bottom one doesn't, and this one doesn't. How do I get it to do that? Well, that is set through the hotbar function in the character configuration. If you go over here to the hotbar settings, designated by, I guess, like two D-pad icons on the controller, and go over here and choose sharing. Certain hotbars will be shared. In order to figure out which hotbar you're working with, you can also open up the HUD layout system to see which hotbars are which. As you can see, this is hotbar 8, hotbar 7 has the names over there selected. Figuring out which hotbar you're working with first is important in order to choose which ones are going to be sharing and not sharing. Sharing hotbars are going to be the ones that stay the same no matter what job you switch from. For example, these three hotbars over here that I have set up are set to switch according to the job that I have equipped. These bottom ones are not because these are the mounts, the chocobo commands, the emotes, the extra functions, and my job roulette. These are set to pretty much stay the same throughout the entire thing, but these particular ones that I use for battling and fighting enemies and going into raids and stuff is used to switch out so I can focus on these particular abilities. This is also can be said for crafters as well, because crafters have a whole new setup going on for them. This is actually good if you want to keep up with certain abilities and you want to have certain abilities stay the same like this particular job wheel or this job bracket that I have, and then have the primary ability bars be exchanged entirely, which is really, really nice and works really nicely for me. Now, inventory is another thing I want to explain. Go back to the character configuration this is going to be just a very slight slight thing but i realize that if you're going to be playing the game at first you'll probably see your inventory be opened up as this this little tiny window with multiple tabs at first it was hard for me to get used to it and then i learned how to expand this particular window if you go over to the character configuration and into item settings you can select this and put it on expanded and even do the same thing for your retainer which is also highly you know, recommended. Just go ahead and do it right now. Retainer is going to be explained a little bit in the future. And you click apply. Now, if you open up your inventory, your inventory is going to be nicely expanded and you'll be able to see everything that is in your bar. If you need to sort it out or auto sort it, simply right click on anything here and click sort. That's what I usually go with because I don't want to be making a whole system for myself and having to be ruined by accidentally sorting. So I just let the sorting function automatically take care of everything here. It separates everything by potions, by the types of food, by the materia, everything. This is going to be eventually all you. All of this is going to be something you'll learn on your own as you start playing the game. You'll realize what the potions are, what materia are, and so on and so forth. The game will teach you pretty much everything that you need to know. As long as you follow the tutorials and make sure you, you know, read the, the text that is presented to you as you level up. Now... Talk a little bit about the items and crystals that is also part of your inventory. This tab right here, key items and crystals are going to be your quest items and your crystals. Crystals can be earned through gathering or just by battling certain elementals or just by questing. Sometimes they can get uh, these crystals just by doing maybe like, not really Pass of the Dead, but maybe like Aquapolis where you unlock chests and rewards or by gathering or by slaying particular elementals. Sometimes they'll drop a fire crystal, ice crystal, all these things are used to synthesize for crafting. Simply just keep it in your inventory, or if you need to move it around, just go ahead and click on it, and drag it out if you really need to, move it around anywhere, or you can, set, uh, you can set it to discard it entirely if you want to. I simply just keep it here. It doesn't really do anything for you if you're not gonna be crafting. If you are gonna be crafting eventually, this stuff will be very important. If you are missing some of this stuff, you can always gather some of the crystals, which you will learn how to do at later levels. Now, talk about the mount. Where do you get the mount from? Well, in the three city states, it's part of your main quest line at level 20. Thank you so much for watching part 1 of Final Fantasy XIV Beginner Guide. I have to separate it out in two to three videos, possibly only two. I may have to make an addendum for this in the future. But otherwise, the guide will be one hour long and I don't want to be putting people through so much information depending on what they're looking for. Now, in this particular guide, I covered the movement, the quest differences, athletes, traveling, and classes and jobs, as well as gear sets. In video two, I should be covering hotbars, inventory, grand company, abilities, map functions, and market board, as well as duty finder. Make sure to check out the video over in the link below if you want to check out that particular portion of the video. Thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next part.